name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Bah! This is known throughout Christendom as Good Shepherd Sunday because in the wisdom of the people that came up with what's called the Revised Common Lectionaries, which is the, the schedule of readings that we have in most mainline Christian churches, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, even the Roman Catholics, we all tend to use the same lessons on the same Sundays. And this one happens to be Good Shepherd Sunday. Ma. So all across Christendom right now, people are getting sermons that are struggling with the problem of the metaphor of sheep. It's a problem because, for one thing, we're very familiar with this story. I mean, this image of Jesus as the good shepherd and us as the sheep is pretty well-trod ground for most Christian churches. But there's more problems than that. For one thing, people generally don't like to be associated with sheep. Uh, when I asked on Facebook you know, what people were thinking about for sermons, a couple of us were asking you know, where people were going. One person said that uh, they really love uh, sheep. They're delicious, especially with mint sauce. Uh, the fact is that we generally do not like to be associated with animals that are vulnerable, stupid, and also delicious. Uh, sheep are not an image that we generally want to be associated with. But I want to tell you that for one thing, I think sheep get a bit of a bad rap. Uh, in fact, sheep aren't stupid at all. Uh, one commentary I read suggested that the, the notion that sheep are stupid came from the cattle industry, uh, who looked disparagingly on the, on the shepherds that had the sheep. That in fact, the difference between see, cows and sheep is that cows you lead from behind. You, you poke at them and you prod at them with paddles or even with cattle prods. Uh, but sheep are a whole different story. You can't get behind sheep and try to push them anywhere. If you do, all they do is push around behind you. Uh, if you've ever seen sheepdogs go through a herd, you see exactly what I'm talking about. They all kind of fan out and circle back, back around. So sheep cannot be pushed. Instead, they must be led. See, sheep aren't stupid. They're not going to go anywhere that they haven't seen someone else go first, whether it's another sheep, whether it's a dog, or whether it's their human masters. So what do we need to do to understand what it means for the good shepherd to call his sheep and for his voice to be heard? Well, the sheep have really bad eyesight. Sheep have poor vision, but they have very good hearing. Um, just yesterday, uh, someone I know who grew up in Scotland told me a story of, of he and his wife were, were out in the countryside and they saw this hill that had just hundreds or thousands of sheep, a very large herd on it, and they were scattered all over this mountain and the next one next door. And in the distance, they saw someone pull up in a jeep on the other mountain and they heard him call out. And then all of a sudden, all the sheep on the two mountains started to march toward him. You know, that's how powerful the call of the shepherd can be. Robert Brown Taylor, a famous uh, preacher and pastor, told this story. She said, In Palestine today, if you visit, you can see a scene very much like what Jesus would have seen. Uh, shepherds tending their flocks during the day. And during the day, you kind of let the sheep go where they want to go and, and to get the good grass from the common lands. And pretty soon the sheep start to mingle with the other shepherds' sheep. And then toward the end of the day, they'll often gather at a watering hole. And again, they're all kind of mixed up and it's sort of hard to tell whose is whose. But what will happen when it's time to go home is the shepherds will each go off to a different area and they'll call their sheep. And each shepherd has their own way of calling the sheep. Uh, some do it with a command, probably some version of come here. Uh, others use a whistle. Uh, some others click their tongues. Uh, probably they use the same method that their fathers used and that those sheep have been called by the same call generation after generation of both sheep and human. So when the sheep hear the call of their masters, they go in that direction. They, they seem to understand who, who is calling them. So understanding this image of sheep as must be called and not simply pushed is important for understanding this image of the good shepherd. The interesting thing about this passage is that it's not actually about sheep at all. It's actually about shepherds. The focus here is the good shepherd, not the okay sheep. Uh, so it may give you some relief to understand that you're not necessarily supposed to identify exclusively with the sheep in the story, but also with the shepherd uh, whom we are called to be as well. So let's look at this good shepherd business. First of all, the word good in this passage is actually a, uh, a Greek word which could be better translated perhaps as noble or ideal or as model. This is the model shepherd, not merely the good shepherd, but the shepherd whom others imitate. Um, it harkens back to the images in the Old Testament where the shepherd is used as an image for, for kings like David and, and even Abraham was a shepherd at one time. And Moses, all these Abrahamic leaders and Jewish leaders all kind of had their heritage and their roots in, in leading literal sheep herds as well as human ones. So, but what's different is versus the Old Testament understanding of sheep and shepherds is this good shepherd is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. He's willing to die for the sheep in a confrontation with wolves or bandits. And that is strange. 
Uh, nobody is going to ask a shepherd to die in order to defend a flock of sheep from wolves. Uh, I mean, who, who does that? I mean, like I said, they're delicious with mint sauce. I mean, one doesn't kill themselves to rescue them. Uh, but this is a different kind of shepherd. This particular good shepherd of Jesus does something else in mind. The second difference is um, that these sheep, they know him, and he knows them. This mutual knowledge thing is also a new uh, take on the Old Testament vision of the good shepherd. But the third, and most interesting to us perhaps, is the notion that this is an expansive flock. Jesus says, there are sheep that belong to my fold that aren't here yet. They'll hear my voice and they'll come. That also is a new take on the old image of the good shepherd. So, as I said before, this passage isn't interesting, interested in sheepness at all. It's interested in shepherdness. It's interested in how we are called to be shepherds, how we are meant to sacrifice our lives for others, how we are meant to know the sheep as we are known by them, and most importantly, how we are to call others who are not even yet a part of this flock to come. So the question is not to ask, how are we good sheep? How are we good at being sheep? But rather, how good are we at being shepherds? How good are we at calling the lost sheep of Israel? You see, the task of the good shepherd is multifold. Uh, first, they have to protect the sheep, obviously. That's why they carry the big stick. That's why there's all this talk about wolves and bandits. Uh, second is to guide them into places of abundance. Think of Psalm 23, the cup running over, the, the green grass, and so on. But perhaps the third and critical piece for us is the shepherd has to have a distinct voice, which is heard over the din of an otherwise confusing and frightening world. The distinct voice that we have as Christians is our offering to the world of a vision that is both an alternative and a critique to the dominant cultural narrative that we inherit. In other words, if the world has the story and understanding of who we are and what we're supposed to be, uh, a story that often uh, goes hand in hand with a certain kind of consumerism, that you you are what you buy and and that kind of thing, uh, if we have an alternative to that, it is also a critique. And the reason that it's a critique is because we make the claim that not only do we offer an alternate lifestyle or an alternate way of understanding what the world is about, that we are created in God's image and so forth and meant to love each other and to give up for each other, not only do we say that, but we also say that what we're saying is grounded in the truth. And because it is true, it becomes a critique. It becomes that thing against which the world must judge itself in a way. And the world finds that threatening. The Christian vision, fully lived and articulated, is a threatening thing. Uh, And I say that because I think most of us fall far short of it. I mean, can you imagine if the world, uh, Christians, people that are actually, say, they're followers of Christ, were willing to go to the extremes that the gospel calls for? I mean, in many cases, I I think we fall short of that. And if we were to come up and live up to that standard, the world would be awesomely transformed. But it's a hard business. It's a hard and difficult road, and no one has asked us for uh, completion just yet. We just strive towards it. But, beloved, the heart of the kingdom vision that we articulate, that heart of that call that we make to God's sheep that we hope they hear and respond to, involves the dual promise of freedom and love. Freedom, because what the Christian story promises is freedom from the karmic cycle of sin and consequence. Freedom from a cycle of of violence and revenge. Uh, Freedom from all the burdens of this world and their terrible demands on us. Love, because at the heart of the Christian message is this notion that God loved the world so much that not only did he create it, he came back into it in order to give it this freedom that he has promised. Again and again, God wants to be in a relationship with us. What's interesting about the sheep is that they are constantly being called into relationship. They're not fleeing from their fears. They're going toward their loves. So we, as shepherds, must learn to articulate that vision which is so attractive and so lovely. Another translation of that word, uh, kalos, which which means ideal or noble or or good in this text, Uh, another translation is beautiful. That word can mean beautiful. What we offer to the world that so desperately wants it is not just a harsh critique or an alternate way of being that might make you happier. What we're offering is something that is actually beautiful, that is precious, that is delightful. Uh, As I was preparing uh, the sermon and I was looking at some different scriptural texts, you know, Uh, People often go to uh, Ezekiel 34, which has a lot of imagery about the pastures and so forth. I thought that was good and great. But then I found myself reading the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, that great love poem in the Bible that you usually only hear at weddings and I think once during the yearly cycle of the three-year cycle of readings in the church. It's rarely heard in church. But the reason that it's in the Bible is because it says something really important about God's relationship with us, which is what this passage is also about, this uh, passage about the Good Shepherd. And at the heart of it is love, a self-sacrificing love, a love that is beautiful, a love that is true. 
And it stands in contrast to the shallow, superficial uh, love that the world so often offers as a cheap substitute. What we offer to the world is the beauty of God's gospel. What we offer is a truth about God's love for us that transcends death, transcends sin, and transcends anything else that might stand between us and the glory that God has intended.